Hello and a very warm welcome to today's very special web seminar all about the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018. My name's David Roth from WPP and it's my pleasure to host today's web broadcast. It's packed with insights and observations. Let's see what we're going to cover. In today's webcast, we're going to cover how the brands are valued, uncover the fastest risers and new entrants. As we count down the Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018. Exclusive interviews with Eric Salama, Chairman and CEO of Kantar. Lindsay Patterson, Chief Transformation Officer of WPP. Karen Blackett, OBE, WPP Country Manager for the UK. Explore what's happening in the brand categories and in markets right across the world. Take a look at the highlights of WPP's special event, The Essential Things to Know About Working and Competing with Amazon, and Brand Z's Top 100 Most Valuable Chinese Brands 2018 launch in Beijing. Hear from brand owners such as Richard Liu, CEO of JD.com, and Stefano Pessina, CEO of Walgreens Boots Alliance. We'll take a deep dive into various trends affecting brand building around the world with CEO of Super Union, Jim Pryor, and CEO of Marketplace Ignition, Eric Heller. You'll find out how you can get more information, download the entire report, get access to mobile apps and data charts, and we'll also bid a fond farewell to a person who's very special to the entire Brand Z project, plus a lot, lot more. So sit down, turn up the volume, and watch live the WPP Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands 2018 Launch Webcast. Hello and a very warm welcome to this webinar from me, David Roth, and all of WPP. The WPP Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands 2018 set a record this year, increasing 21%, the highest year-on-year -year percentage increase in a decade, and the greatest addition a brand value ever, 748 billion US dollars. This surge rippled across every category without exception. This stellar achievement followed 12 years of steady growth, despite buffeting by the global economic crisis and by ongoing, ever-increasing disruption from e-commerce, radically changing shopping habits and new technologies, including artificial intelligence and fintech. Although this year's stronger global economy influenced the value increase, it was only one factor. A rising tide floats all ships, but a growing economy does not float all brands, at least not equally. Strong brands do better, usually much, much better. The best evidence is the stock market. Over the past 12 years, when the S&P 500 increased 102%, the Brand Z Strong Brand Portfolio, brands in the Global 100 with the strongest brand equity, increased 172%. That growth gap is worth a lot of shareholder money. And the gap is getting even wider. Brands that are different and innovative themselves disrupt growth value faster than even the strongest brands. Over the past 12 years, our Brand Z Strong and Innovative Brands portfolio increased 226% in value, more than twice the rate of the S&P 500. Here's the key insight. Brands that depend on the economy tide alone may be caught in the turbulence. Growth, even survival, depends on being innovative and different and communicating those advantages 
in innovative and different ways. The Brands Eat Top 100 Most Valuable Brands is created to help you and all brand builders understand how to grow and sustain value in today's disruptive marketplace. Our analysis finds that brands grow value by anticipating and fulfilling the needs and wants of consumers in relevant ways that are innovative, create an emotional connection and distinguish the brand from its competition. This is why in a year of record-breaking value growth it's important to acknowledge that it's not just the economy. It's brand and brand building that makes the difference. As the market becomes even more complex, brands will only become even more important. And that's what we'll be discussing and debating in this special web session from many different angles and with a wide variety of experts. So, let's get going. Well, I'm now here with Ellsworth Chung, who is the Global Brand Z Director for the Valuations. Ellsworth, thanks very much indeed for joining us. There's probably a large number of people who are watching this broadcast uh, for the first time, might not have watched uh, over the course of the last few years, might not have been uh, employees or colleagues of WPP companies. So let's start at the very beginning um, and let's just talk a little bit about the Brand Z data set and then how you get from the Brand Z data set to a brand valuation. Yeah, sure, David. So we are here today to celebrate the 13th launch of our global top 100 ranking today. But actually, Brand Z is way more than just brand value rankings. We are also the largest brand building platform in the world. So since 20 years ago, we have been interviewing more than 3 million consumers about the perception of 120,000 brands in more than 50 markets around the world. And brands is not just big data, but also deep data. So we've been gathering a lot of insight, brand building insight, on the back of our 5.1 billion data point. Right, so this really is sort of big data on steroids. We look at that number of data points that we now have in uh, the Brandy data set that's available for all WPP colleagues right, right. around the world in, for, they, for them to use. And we'll be talking a little bit later about how uh, you can get access to that various different data sets. Right. But how do you go from um, an understanding of a brand through the Brandy data set to actually a brand valuation? Yeah, so let's quickly talk about how we actually put a value on the brand. Uh, on a brand. So um, number one, definitely financial value. So how much of the value of a brand that is directly related to the brand that we want to measure? So we want to find out in dollar terms what's the worth of a brand. But on top of that, more importantly, is brand contribution. So it's powered by a brand C brand building platform. Um, for the last 20 years of data and basically we measure the proportion of the financial value that is directly driven by a brand's ability to number one, drive volume and number two, to charge premium. And two, the two together will form what we call brand value and this is how we rank brands in our brand C rankings. Now, uh, one of the key aspects I suppose of uh, the value of a brand is how the market sees it. Um, and I suppose the ultimate of that um, is how the stock market sees it. Right. Um, it's very interesting to have a look at how our uh, top 100 most valuable global brands and the subsets of those perform against the stock market indices. Right, you're right David. So um, since um, uh, 13 years ago when we first launched our global rankings, we have been tracking the share price performance of our strong brands, brands is strong brands. And what we find out is brand C strong brands outperformed S&P 500 by 70%. So if we take a more global view, we will see that actually um, our brand C portfolio outperformed the MSCI Global by more than three times. So it shows that again and again, brand building is not a cost. It is an investment that's going to give us a very long-term shareholders return. So investing in a brand, um, Invest, putting definitely. money into growing, developing, maintaining, uh, creating even uh, yep. brands, um, you see significantly higher yep. uh, shareholder growth when 
that brand is a top, uh, most valuable brand. Yep. Now, as of, before I let you go, you've been doing quite a lot of work looking at, uh, I suppose, what one could, could categorise as consumer brands versus business-to-business -business brands, although I think that terminology is something um, that uh, we need to find new words for. Right. Um, when you look at, I suppose, more business-centric brand versus consumer-centric brands, Right. What do we see the main differences are in terms of, uh, of, of how consumers and business people see them? Yeah, so definitely, uh, David. So brand C, why brand C is the best in the market? Because we have all these consumer opinions on the back of it. And what we see is, number one, brand equity is still the main driving force for brand values. It's a very important uh, element to it. Uh, but if we take a, look, a closer look at what happens to the performance of B2B brands versus B2C brands, actually the B2B brands are performing quite well. Actually, they are on a lot of our key brand C measures, they are above average. But if we put them just right next to the B2C brands, what we find is actually B2B brands still has a lot to learn from this B2C counterpart. And if we take a look at the five pillars of how we assess brand health in brand C, it is the area of communications that the B2B brands have to, uh, to focus on and invest in in the future. So we see that actually maybe it's an opportunity for the B2B brands to have more partnership with B2C brands in order to move on with the pace of the world. Well, Elizabeth, thanks very much. You've had a very busy year because uh, this year we've seen, what, almost 15, 16 individual uh, right. country rankings yeah. uh, that you and your team uh, have done. Um, this is the top 100 global launch. In a few weeks' time, we'll be looking for the very start, first time at uh, the Australian most valuable right. uh, brands um, and then uh, closely followed uh, for, by the Indonesian um, right. most valuable brands. So, uh, Elizabeth, thank you and your team very much indeed. Thank you, David. Well, we've just seen how we value a brand. Now it's the time to see the results of those valuations. It's time to reveal the WPP Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018.
Well, earlier on, a few weeks ago, I managed to catch up with the Chairman and Chief Executive of Cantor, Eric Salama. Well, I'm now joined by Eric Salama, who's the Chairman and Chief Executive of Cantor. Eric, thanks very much indeed Pleasure. for joining us. It's quite interesting when you look at the uh, ranking results for 2018. You know, we've, in 2018, we see the highest percentage increase of the brand value that we've ever seen. Uh, we've seen every single sector increase in value, which is uh, uh, strange. Nice, but uh, we don't see that every year. Does this mean that the world's economy is back in full tilt and uh, we're well past the recession, which seems to have lasted forever? Well, I think companies are sitting on a ton of cash, um, so they can spend it in lots of different ways. And we are seeing companies thinking more and more about how to grow their top line and how to increase their prices. So I think to some extent, there's a lot of confidence in the business sector around the world, and we've seen that really everywhere. But we do need to remember that our brand rankings and our brand valuations are partly dependent on what happens to the stock market and to the financial side of it, and that has boomed everywhere. But it partly depends also on the relationship between the brand and the customer. And I think there we've seen a much more varied picture with some of the brands not building a stronger relationship and some brands doing exceptionally well in terms of building that. I mean, from what you said, you, you spend quite a lot of time talking to uh, global CMOs, global, global CEOs. Um, do you see them looking at what they're currently doing and saying, actually, the balance is slightly off tilt now and we need to sort of put our foot more on the accelerator of growing the brand and demand generating as opposed to managing costs, which seems to have been uh, what people have been doing over the last few years? I think they're still going through both. Certainly in the packaged goods area, we still have a lot of our clients who are looking at their costs and cutting. And um, I think it's always worth remembering that kind of lesson that we've learned from Brand Z and we've proved time and time again through other studies which is that companies who invest in their brands do grow faster and grow shareholder value faster. Um, but I think we are seeing a lot of questioning from clients as to how to spend that money, what's the best way of generating demand. So I think they all want to generate more demand. Some of them have got the kind of plan nailed and they're doing it, and some of them are still figuring out what it is that they need to do to generate that kind of demand. Now, for a long time, We've been talking, and in fact WPP have been investing in China for years, um, around a sort of a, a continuous growth. Uh, there are a lot of sceptics about two to three years ago saying that China was sort of just about to fall off the edge of a cliff and a lot of doom and despondency. We certainly haven't seen that, China hasn't seen that, and yet, and actually we've seen this year, um, when we first started doing the rankings, there was one Chinese brand, there are 14 Chinese brands. JD.com um, is the fastest growing uh, brand in the rankings this year. What's going on in China? Is this, is this a market that really is just about to, to accelerate again? So I do think we're seeing an incredibly assertive, self-confident China, and the thing that people who haven't been to China when they go can't believe is that China is not an emerging market. It's not a developing market. It's the most sophisticated e-commerce market in the world bar none. So the, the idea that this is this kind of big country catching up with the US or Europe, it's just that that may have been the case ages ago. It's certainly not the case now. And do you think that model, if it is indeed a model, of uh, large c countries becoming much more self-confident in themselves and in their brands is something that we see or will see across um, other countries and, yeah. and you know, giving a, a run for the money for the, uh, for the uh, multinationals as well. I think we're seeing it everywhere. I think we're seeing it in India, where local brands are growing faster than multinational brands. We're seeing it in Indonesia, we're seeing it in Colombia, we're seeing it in Brazil. Um, and I think what we're then seeing as a result of that is a lot of the multinational companies saying to themselves explicitly, we need to be much more country focused. We can't just take our global methods and roll them out. We need to give more autonomy to individual countries within a framework. So I think we are beginning to see much more of a battle at a local level 
And if you talk to most of the multinationals in most sectors, their competition is not the other multinationals, it's the local players who are closer to the customer often, more agile, faster, they're sometimes family owned, so easier to make decisions. Um, and I think that's where the real battleground is. When we spoke uh, last year around the um, launch of uh, the 2017 rankings, uh, your Kantar first strategy was in its infancy. Um, it's been uh, uh, rolled out for more than a year now. Um, what difference is that making both uh, internally but probably much more importantly to our clients? Uh, well, we're seeing um, clients at schools zoom up. Most importantly, we're getting the best of Kantar to our clients. So more often than not now, we're actually getting the best capabilities, the best thinking, the best combination of offers to our clients, regardless of what brand they're working for within Kantar. So I think clients have really responded well to that. It's a very difficult environment that we're working in, but we're growing share, um, we're growing customer satisfaction, um, and we have our clients quite openly saying, you're delivering to us in a way that you didn't 18 months ago, which is fantastic. I think the other thing which is beginning to happen is that for our people, they're getting more opportunities to really learn. There's a lot more sharing that's going on internally. People aren't keeping good stuff to themselves and worrying about sharing it in every aspect of our business, in marketing, in finance, in HR, um, in how you grow a business, in business development, in how you do events. I mean, really in every part of what we do, there's a real spirit of sharing the best and people learning from that. So we've still got a long way to go. I don't want to suggest that we're all done and dusted, but we're in a completely different place internally and externally than we were a couple of years ago. Now, I think many people think there's an elephant in the room which we haven't talked about, um, which is some of the press comments about what may or may not happen to, uh, to Kantar um, in a slightly different WPP world. Yeah. Um, what's your perspective? Well, Mark and Andrew have said that um, WPP is doing a strategic review and that um, you know, I have every confidence that they'll do a review which is in the best interest of WPP and all of its stakeholders. Um, I'm very confident in the future of Kantar. I think we have a great business. We do great work. We have great impact on clients. Um, so I'm, you know, whatever happens, happens. But I think um, the people in Kantar will be fine and Kantar will be fine as a business. I hope that it's within WPP going forward. So it's been a pretty strange uh, year, Eric, hasn't it? It has, it has. And as an Arsenal supporter, Arsene Wenger leaving Arsenal has been a big shock to all of us. Well, uh, that's after 22 years. Martin leaves WPP after, what, 35, 36 years. Do you think we'll get a, you know, a triple and uh, the Queen might abdicate <laughs> in 2018? Oh, please, no. <laughs> well, Eric Salama, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dee, for joining us. Thank you very much. Well, as I said earlier, when I was speaking to Ellsworth, it's been a phenomenally busy year for the Brand Z valuation teams and all of us here at Brand Z because we've introduced six new country rankings to the Brand Z family and four new ones that will be appearing over the course of the next few months. All those reports that are crammed with insights and thought leadership pieces and great observations that you can use are available for you to download free of charge from the Brand Z website, www.brandz.com. Let's take a look at which countries we've covered and the ones we're about to.
Well, as we said a little bit earlier, Ellsworth and her team certainly had their work cut out uh, for them in creating all the brand valuations for all of those rankings. Well, I'm now joined by Doreen Wang, who's the global head of Brands E for Millwood Brown. Doreen, thanks very much indeed. We've seen uh, the uh, Brands E Top 100 Most Valuable uh, Global Brands, the top new Top uh, 100. Let's delve a little bit deeper underneath the surface of that, just to really understand what some of the driving factors are for the growth uh, in uh, the brand values we see in 2018. And then we'll talk a little bit about some specifics. So overall, looking at the value growth that we've seen this year versus last year, what does the picture look like? It is a record year, David. The global top 100 brands has a massive growth of 21% and reached $4.4 trillion. The number looks big. The number is actually very big. It's almost equal to the GDP of Japan. 100 brands value is equal to the third largest economy of the world. And we have a value added only in the past year is $0.7 trillion. It's larger than the country GDP of Sweden. Over the past 12 years, and the total value growth is 204%, and the value added is $2.9 trillion. So that is a huge number. There are three key factors behind the growth of this year. Number one is the relatively robust economy. Number two is technology, technology, technology. The technology brands and the tech-related brands have achieved their value growth significantly. Here we are not just talking about Google, uh, Netflix, Netflix and Apple, we are also talking about manufacturing brand, cosmetics brands who are partnering with technology brands in delivering superior consumer experience. For example, like Dior, Adidas, Shiseido all have grown their value a lot. The third reason is the Chinese brands are on the rise. And for the first time ever, the growth rate of the Chinese brands has doubled the speed of the U.S. brand. And the fastest riser, JD.com, is from China. It's a leading e-commerce platform. Well, let's take a look at the top five, because all of those factors you've spoken about are well reflected in this year's top five. What do we see there? Exciting is Google has achieved a 23% value growth and retains as this year's number one. And the Google from driverless car to uh, solar power, the contact lenses to machine learning, and there are so many innovations and consumers' perception on the brand's innovation remains very high and keeps delivering meaningful and relevant services to the consumers. Apple, and uh, also from app, the launch of uh, iPhone X to, to AirPod and to uh, Watch 3, and it remains to be our number two and keeping reaching consumers So number life. one, number two this year are the same, but we see a change in number three. What's we that? have a new number three this year, exciting. Amazon has moved up to number three. It's an ecosystem brand, as we all know, and from uh, e-commerce to Alexa to the launch of Echo 3 devices, it's surrounding everywhere we are living. Yeah, we even it's have our own brand Z Alexa yes, skill for people to play around with. We do. And the Microsoft is our number four and it's also the number one B2B brand and very strong in cloud service and hybrid cloud. Now, and you talked a little bit earlier about the growth of uh, Chinese brands. This is now reflected in uh, the new number five. Yes, we have. It's not monopoly by the U.S. brand anymore. Now we have uh, Tencent from China, first time ever entering the top five. And Tencent is uh, e uh, is a social uh, platform from e uh, from social to e-commerce and to, uh, and, and what to is, mobile and payments. What's, and what's the significance of that of a Chinese brand now being uh, in the top five of the uh, top 100 most valuable global brands in the world? We are seeing the battle between the West and the East, and specifically between the U.S. and China for the technology leadership is escalating. Now, um, give us some big, bold sort of uh, understanding of the changes that we're seeing in terms of brand value from maybe when we started doing uh, yeah. the uh, valuations, uh, what, 12, 13 years ago to where we are today. You don't need to tell me we're living in a fast-changing world. and the. the 
total top 100 brands value 12 years ago is, uh, is even less than today's top 10. Uh, and also, all our top 10 this year have passed the 100 billion threshold. All of them are over I mean, that is actually quite, quite extraordinary in terms of the, the value now, the dollar value of some of these massive, great big big brands. Yeah, for sure. And uh, every year we talk about the top 10 are all from United States. Not anymore. Now two of the top 10 are from China. We talked about Tencent. The other one is Alibaba and e-commerce dined within and beyond China. Okay, um, let's look at, I mean, last year we coined this phrase, which was very much picked up uh, by the Financial Times in their coverage uh, and a lot of other papers, about the fearsome five, uh, the uh, dominant technology brands. We've done some work looking at the fear uh, the, uh, the, those five versus a new terminology we talked about, which is the Chinese trailblazers. What do we see when you compare those two you call sets them together? Fearsome five or friendly five, whatever, and their growth. Well, I, I, I call them the fearsome five. <laughs> yeah, over the past the seven years, is a massive 194 percent. So they almost triple their brand value. But in the meantime, the Chinese trailblazers here we are talking about Tencent, Alibaba, Huawei, JD.com, and Baidu. Their value growth is 12 times. So it's a phenomenal. And again, to our earlier point, is this competition between the West and East on technology leadership will continue. Well, it's interesting to see how that's going to play out because I suppose, you know, in terms of the value, the fearsome five are significantly greater, but the rate of growth. Um, yeah. Our Chinese trailblazers are growing. And not just in China, rate. like Huawei is beyond China. Over 100 countries have their footprint. It's a, it's the third largest smartphone brand already. Okay. Um, when we started this study in 2000 and uh, six. Time, time's flies. Um, the top ten really are unbelievably different to the top ten in 2018. Staggeringly yes. different. different. What do you make of that? Let's travel back the time machine to 12 years ago. So you drove your Toyota and, uh, and the park at City, get some cash and drove to Walmart and buy a pack of Marlboro and some Coke. Those are still very strong brands nowadays, but they are not in the top 10 anymore. And because right now you are making orders with your iPhone and talk to Siri and others through Alexa and the product is delivered in your front door in a few hours or next day, consumers' purchase journey have completely changed. And that gives a lot of the digital brands, the artificial intelligence brands, a huge opportunity to create the next generation of brands. Well, Doreen, let's now take a closer look at those new entrants. Um, this year we see some very, very interesting newcomers in the brands you top 100 most valuable global brands. Give us an overview. They are from many categories from every corner of the world. Spectrum is one of the disruptive telco companies from the US. JD is the leading e-commerce in China. Uber, we don't need to mention how strong the leadership in the sharing economy. HP is back to the game. And SF Express is the leading logistics company in China and helping e-commerce penetrating into lower tiers. Instagram, 500 active users, a lot of teen users, and, and 25 million business accounts. So luxury and fashion brands did a great job on, on Instagram. And I think that's a very important point to make overall in the newcomers list, is it does cover lots of different sectors and it does cover lots of different countries now so and any any brand has the capacity and the ability um, to be a big valuable brand in our 
top 100. We see all of them. And speaking of every corner, and we have one brand from, from Indonesia this year entered our top 100. It is BCA, the leading bank from Indonesia, very dedicated to serving everyone in, the, in, the, in the Indonesia, giving them a lot of financial support. And also Adidas, last year's fastest riser, is achieved another big growth from 3D shoe printing to social way, to ocean waste uh, uh, being utilized to produce one million shoes and innovate for a strong social purpose. Well, I said right at the very beginning that we would unveil which Indonesian brand is now in the top 100, and you've done it. Thanks very much uh, indeed. Um, very interesting when you look at those lists of newcomers um, in terms of their brand diagnostics versus some of the brands that have been there for some time. Is it more difficult to enter our global top 100? The answer is yes, because these new brands, they have a stronger brand power and stronger endorsement and loved by the consumers. Also, they are able to have a, a, a higher brand premium and a stronger potential for the future growth. On the other side, those brands dropped out of the top 100 and their growth momentum is slowing down. So we live in this fastly disrupting world. If you cannot keep up with that speed, you are lagging behind. Well, Dorian Wang, the global head of Brand Z for Mobile Brand, thanks very much indeed for Thank joining us. Thank you very us. much, David. Well, I'm now joined by Martin Guerrero, who is the research director for Millwood Brown and Brand Z. Martin, thanks very much indeed. No problem. It hardly seems a year since we were last here talking no, it's about crazy. Uh, the uh, 2017 results. So here we are, 2018. One of the things that we've seen is the fact that every single category this year has increased in value. How strange is that? Well, it's very strange. I mean, we've been doing the, the valuations for 12 years now, and it's the first year ever um, that all 14 categories in their own right have increased in value. So, yes, it's been a great year for the top 100 in its entirety, 21% growth. But, yeah, very special year from a category perspective, too. And when you delve into those categories, what do we see? Um, I mean, the headline categories really are retail and technology. So the retail growth, uh, the biggest growing category this year, um, and that's really driven by um, the march of the e-commerce brands. Um, so brands like Alibaba and JD.com from China have had stellar years. Both have almost doubled their brand value in 12 months, which is quite incredible. Technology, again, in absolute dollar terms, is by far the biggest growing category, driven by um, the likes of Amazon um, that have had a fantastic year as well. So retail and tech are the two big stories. And what's, it, what's in between those? <laughs> In between those, I mean, insurance has had a fantastic time of it as well. I mean, clearly we live in a time of uncertainty. Insurance brands have reaped some of the rewards of that. Um, but those are the real big three um, growth stories this year from a category perspective. Um, now, over time, um, what changes do we see in terms of which categories um, when we started um, were large versus what categories now? Uh, a large. Yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, if we look back to 2006, it was really a two-horse race between consumer and the tech-related brands. But if we fast forward 12 years, we really see that those tech-related brands have taken a massive step forward, and they really account for the lion's share of value, more than half of the value for tech-related brands. So particularly brands like Netflix um, has had a fantastic year this year, Amazon as well, amongst others. I mean, technology as a whole, tech-related brands have grown by more than 350% over the course of 12 years, which is quite incredible and obviously reflective of the way that we as consumers are changing. Now, tech brands have done a remarkable job in creating alliances mm. um, to grow their businesses, I suppose, taking the lead from uh, Windows, Microsoft, sort of Intel. Yeah. Um, we're seeing huge changes in the way in which some of those partnerships work. What, what can other brands learn from the lessons of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I think over the last couple of years, we as Brand Z have talked a lot about technology, the rise of tech brands, but we're clearly not saying that you have to be a technology brand to grow. Um, so tech literacy, being able to build successful partnerships, take advantage of technological advances globally is increasingly important. And a lot of brands are doing that across sectors, not just the technology brands. So take Budweiser's partnership with Lyft as an example. Um, clearly, um, as, a, as a way to reduce drink driving, 
that partnership basically gives um, free rides to people who are basically out drinking with their friends as a safe way to get home. So a great example of a non-tech brand in Budweiser taking account of a partnership with a tech company like Lyft ultimately. But there are others too. So um, obviously in the news in the last couple of weeks, we've had the partnership between Nestle and Starbucks, clearly as a way of improving brand experience with Nespresso in mind particularly. So we know brand experience drives brand value. Um, so really we feel that partnerships, the increasing prevalence that we're seeing is clearly a play by some of the big brands and some of the small brands to improve brand experience and ultimately drive value. Well, um, let's look at some of the specific brands that we see. PayPal's an interesting example. Yeah, so PayPal continues the, um, the partnership theme, so they've had a great year um, as well in value terms, but they've had very fruitful partnerships with both Visa, MasterCard and other payment providers too, and all of that has resulted in increasing meaningful difference, driving of brand value, and obviously as we see digitization of cash um, becoming more of a trend, mobile payments have increased 50% this year, so PayPal have positioned themselves extremely well to ride that wave. Um, and those partnerships have helped them um, do that, and we've seen a fantastic rise for them this year. Okay, well, let's um, take a look at some of the categories and some of the big trends we see. Let's start with fast foods. A yeah. favourite, a particular favourite of mine. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Um, so trust as well as partnership is another big theme we've seen this year. Um, so we know and we've learnt over the years with Brand Z that those brands that are uh, more trusted are the ones that are best positioned to grow in value. Um, fast food is really uh, an embodiment of that at a category level. So we've seen that not only do the fast food brands that are the most trusted um, share uh, or have the biggest share of value within fast food, they actually grow at the fastest rate as well. So they've grown 26% over the last 12 months those that are more trusted versus those that are least trusted. Okay, moving from the sublime to the ridiculous <laughs> um, to yeah. oil and gas. Yeah, completely different category, but again, we see the importance of trust for any category. So Shell have had a fantastic year. They've increased their brand value by 10%. Their profitability has actually increased by 50% over the course of 12 months. And Shell are the only um, oil and gas brand at a global level um, of the global conglomerates that have actually increased their trust performance over time. That clearly links to their brand value. Um, they've really embraced uh, trends like decarbonisation, but they're also um, uh, revisiting the way that they approach retail. So some partnerships uh, to talk about there too, um, drivers of Jaguar cars um, and Land Rovers as well can actually now pay for their fuel on shell forecourts without even leaving their vehicles via mobile phones. So again, it's showing that partnerships and trust can really enhance brand experience and ultimately drive value. Shell's a great example of that. Well, I suppose trust is at its uh, ultimate in terms of the luxury sector, because in a sense yes. you're, you know, you're, you're buying the, uh, the trustworthiness and the efficacy of, of uh, the luxury brand. What do we see there? What lessons does the luxury sector teach us all? Yeah, absolutely. So again, it underlines the fact that trust is important in any sector. Luxury, as you say, is, uh, is clearly um, an example of that too. Gucci have had a fantastic year. Um, our number one most valuable Italian brand from our Italian launch earlier this year. Um, they've got a new creative director. They've really gone after the millennial market. And in fact, 50% of Gucci's um, global revenues, um, they say, are now generated by the millennial consumer. Um, so by fostering that relationship with a new audience, um, an audience that will be very valuable to them, um, they've really built those trust credentials with that group and they're starting to reap the rewards. And we'd expect to see that brand continue to go from strength to strength. Well, Martin Guerrera, um, thank you very much indeed. I can't let you go without asking you a question. We've seen in your deck a whole series of little symbols that look like periodic table symbols. Okay. Um, it's a project that we've been working on. Uh, where's it from and what's it all about? Uh, brand genome, yeah. Well, that was, um, I'd like to think, a collaboration between you and me. Um, almost a clash of um, the world of biology with the world of, uh, of brands and chemistry as well. Um, so by running a, a brand genome report for any brand in the Brand Z database, it can give the user a simple one-page overview of all of our Brand Z measures on one page. Um, accompanied by um, uh, another page as well to explain what all those measures actually mean in practice and some, some tutorial videos as well. So a fantastic way of starting a pitch, learning um, a lot more about a brand that you knew nothing about just half an hour ago. So um, we definitely encourage people to use that. Uh, and that's available to every single one of our uh, WPP uh, colleagues uh, right across the globe and we'll be giving you um, the URLs of hanging and access to that a little later on. But for the moment, uh, Martin Guerrera, Head of Research for Brandsy and Millwood Brown, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you, David. Well, a few weeks ago, we were on the road. We went to Madrid for the 2018 World Retail Congress, where 
senior retailers from around the planet gathered to discuss some of the key issues that were affecting retailing today and in the future. We also launched there the Brandsy Top 75 Most Valuable Global Retail Brands for 2018. At the Congress, we spoke with many of the world's global retail leaders. And those individual interviews are available for you to watch on the Brand Z YouTube channel. Here is just a flavour of a couple. Your model is a very different model to uh, other e-commerce players, especially in China. The concept of uh, creating and developing your in a, a supply chain that you own and control. Why was that so important to you? I think a retailer, what's the value of a retailer? To my uh, uh, mind, I think the most two important things one is customer experience, and uh, another one to help the brands to making more value to them. So supply chain is both on the matter of customer experience and also on the matter of you know our suppliers, our brand owners. So my uh, vision is want to try to build a most efficient and the lowest cost of the whole supply chain to serve both our partners and our you know, customers. And, and in doing that, do you believe that, in, uh, that the customer experience will be significantly better with you controlling the supply chain rather than outsourcing it to other people? Yes, definitely. I think uh, in the past uh, 12 years time have, has approved that. Now, uh, your an amazing adopter of new technologies. Uh, you were uh, delivering uh, packages by drones long before uh, Amazon even thought about it. Um, what extent do you think technology is going to be driving retailing in the next few years? For, for my next 10 years, only one, inside my company, only one thing is most important is technology. We are trying to use uh, both visual technology and physical technology to build a whole system which can connect the whole world by the goods and the service. And uh, today, on the traditional business way, our supply chain efficiency is very, uh, very good. But if you go forward or keep uh, developing it, we must use the technology. It's the only path for us to achieve that. Do you work in a, in a position with your customers in an amazingly high trust environment? I can't think of any other, apart from a hospital probably, where, where you, you demand trust. How important is the brand in, in, in making the customer feel that this is a business that they do have trust in? Very important, very important. The fact that uh, uh, I am talking for us, but I could talk for all of our uh, peers, uh, the fact that we have a brand which has been on the market for uh, uh, more than a century, uh, and we have brands, not a brand, we have many brands that have been on the market for uh, more than a century, uh, and, uh, and has uh, earned the trust uh, of, the, uh, of, of the customers, of course it's uh, important. This doesn't mean uh, that uh, you don't have to continue to earn this trust, because uh, if your customers are not uh, satisfied, of course, uh, they will uh, uh, they will go somewhere else, and uh, even worse, uh, they will um, uh, make public their dissatisfaction uh, yes. <laughs> because now with the Twitter uh, very quickly, as well. very quickly. Straight to you. <laughs> so you have uh, you have to continue. You have to continue to satisfy them and to understand how they are evolving and evolve with them.
uh, you know, I, uh, what I am always uh, uh, telling our, our people, I, am, I have said this for 40 years, you have to be ready to change and change and change again, because the change is the essence of, of retail. But as long as you can do this, uh, uh, you can uh, keep your stores and uh, you, you cannot only survive but also thrive. Well, not only is today the launch of the Top 100 Global Brands, it also is the launch of a new Brandsy product available to everybody across the WPP group. Today launches Celebrity Z, a way that you can look at how a celebrity resonates with any particular brand that you have. It's done in partnership with Spotted and will very much help you understand which celebrity and which brand are best suited to go with each other. At the end of the program, I'll be giving you a URL where you can download a lot of the things we've talked about, as well as an example of what a Celebrity Z report would look like. Enjoy. Well, I'm now joined by Peter Walsh, who's a director of uh, Cantor Millwood Brown and the wise sage of uh, Brandsy. Peter, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, risers, the top 20 risers that we've seen in this year's rankings. As a generality, how would you classify that group of brands? I would first of all classify that group of brands as stunningly successful. That's, not a, bad, that's not a bad category to be in. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll be in the stunningly <laughs> successful category, which to get into the top uh, 20 rises this year, you needed to have grown by over 40% in value over the last year, compared to 20% the previous year. And what's really interesting is that uh, the seven of the brands are from China, and seven are from the US. So again, we're seeing the battle between East and West, and the top three risers are all from China. Does that mean the battle is being won by the Chinese or is the battle still in progress? Uh, the battle is very much still in progress because certainly we see uh, JD.com at the top which has virtually doubled its value over the last year uh, and it's interesting because it's been doing partnership with Tencent which is the number one Chinese yes. brand. Yes. The and indeed Tencent own a reasonable proportion of uh, JD.com. Yes, they do indeed, and it's that partnership thing for mutual success which is uh, very, very uh, abundant. Alibaba is the second uh, top riser, and that brand, just to get the scale of that, uh, on the last singles day, it sold over 25 billion worth of goods. So if and, you that's, put that, and that's just in one day, Peter, isn't that's it? That's in, in hour one period. day, and that is the equivalent to the value of a top 50 brand, a Mercedes or a BMW. And at number three, just only marginally behind that, uh, we see the third Chinese brand, which is Mutai, which is a, a really fantastic premium Chinese wine spirit brand, yeah. which is benefiting very much from the rising middle and upper middle class as they go into lots of home entertainment. I've had many Mutai hangovers in the morning. <laughs> Doesn't, doesn't feel as good as it did the, the, uh, the previous night, I can assure you. And of course, you. the price you paid for it also would <laughs> yes. be a, a premium as well, which is why they're making so much money. <laughs> what about towards the back end? I know you said that list is, to, to be on that list is sensational. At the back end of that list, what are we seeing? There? Yes, indeed. I mean, well, there's, as I say, there's a whole mix. Uh, Shiseido is a very interesting brand from Japan, which again is driven by a great sense of purpose. Uh, so that brand is also grown up at the 40% level. Um, Amazon, of course, which is only marginally behind Tencent in terms of adding the most value this year. Tencent added over 70 billion. Amazon a mere 68 uh, billion. That, that is quite year. extraordinary given its performance last year. So it's not as if the they're annualizing a small increase. The bigger growing bigger and Amazon's interesting because obviously it's launched its first Amazon Go cashierless shop 
uh, or outlet, so you just go in there and buy and nobody hassles you, just take your goods, it automatically bills you. Uh, more bookshops are going into physical uh, space as well. And also uh, Amazon Studios uh, produced a film, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which won a Golden Globe. And how can you forget uh, Whole Foods as well? So uh, with that, Peter, don't go away. We'll be back with you very shortly. Thanks very much. Well, I managed to catch up with globe-trotting Lindsay Patterson, WPP's Chief Transformation Officer, when she was in New York just a few weeks ago. Well, I'm very pleased to be joined by Lindsay Patterson, who is WPP's Chief Transformation Officer. Lindsay, thanks very much indeed for uh, joining us. Um, it is impossible to read any newspaper or trade magazine, um, the marketing trade or any trade for that matter, without uh, transformation being at least in five or six different articles. From your perspective, as WPP's Chief Transformation Officer, um, what is transformation in today's business world? I think transformation is the positive uh, way to tackle the disruption that everyone is facing in our industry. So uh, I use uh, the phrase uh, created at the World Economic Forum um, a couple of years ago about the fourth industrial revolution, which is a technological revolution, which has fundamentally changed the way that we live, operate as consumers and businesses. So true end-to-end -end transformation because technology now enables everything to be connected. So I think it's really important as we recognize that all of our clients are going through significant disruption and technological change and as consumers are experiencing that themselves that we ourselves show that we are ready to transform fundamental opportunity or the fundamental role is to um, accelerate change to be agile and to change ourselves actually ahead of the market rather than in reaction to the market now you're clearly spending a lot of time talking to uh, our clients and potential clients, what is it that uh, they want um, from uh, a marketing services group in today's environment and probably more important in what they envisage tomorrow's environment is going to be? I, I think there's some really core cool themes which is I think we have as WPP we've delivered very successfully on integrated offers or client teams um, that have been put together um, to create kind of one access point into WPP. Um, and we create team structures that, that are bespoke for each client. What clients want now, we still want, we still see clients really wanting an integrated offer, but they want a much more fluid, a much more agile and adaptive model. Um, so that is actually a significant change. They still want integration, they need integration because our world is ever more complex. Um, but they, they want us to be simpler to access, they want WPP itself to be easier to navigate. And I think the other fundamental shift now is because of that technological change and the, uh, the opportunity that affords. It, uh, the clients not only want an integrated team you know, with, with a clear leader that, that can access across the group, but they want an end-to-end -end operating system underpinned by a technology stack that means all of their data points can be connected. And so the, the core change probably that we're seeing over the last 18 months is an end-to-end -end connected customer experience enabled by joining all of those data points uh, with a technology layer below. Uh, and given, I suppose, that very data-centric world, uh, what challenges do you see for us uh, in, in terms of WPP across the world, but also in terms of how our clients organise internally to be able to take advantage of uh, that sort of vision of uh, sort of 
a real-time trading. We need our clients to be as adaptive, fast and fluid as, as agencies need to step up and be as well. We need to have conversations with their CIOs and their CTOs, not just um, uh, CMOs, because obviously those functions are now interconnected. So I think the, the worst thing that could happen or the danger of what could happen would be that the CIOs or CTOs are not conjoined to the CMOs and your data strategy at a client level is not joined up. I mean, we need to make sure that the client is using their data as effectively as possible and that we on the agency side are able to do that as well. So we need to make sure that all elements are connected. So that would be the, the challenge back into clients is to ensure that, that their C-suite is totally aligned uh, on their own uh, technology journey. Now, a universal data stack is probably uh, uh, um, uh, something that everybody is going to aspire to in this sort of new world. Going back, I suppose, to the old analog world, if we can use that analogy, is, is people and talent. Um, what's yeah. the challenge now to retain really good quality talented people given the the pulls on talent um, from established companies startups and high-tech companies around the world um, I think we need to fish in a wider pool um, I think we need to have really clear programs and some of our agencies do this incredibly well some of our markets do this incredibly well actually we need to be linked into uh, university programs and 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 talking about the variety, the depth and the opportunity that, that um, a bright graduate can get by working uh, in a business like WPP with access across all of those services to be able to learn all those capabilities and show them that there's a career path that is open um, and, and exciting. Um, I think we do need to consider um, how we move talent around the group. That, that's something I feel quite strongly about, that we need more T-shaped, we need to split deep specialist expertise in some core areas, but we also need people that are T-shaped, people that can truly understand the breadth of a client's challenge. Um, and I think, you know, we, we talk about a world where, uh, you know, an algorithm-driven world or a machine learning-driven world, and I, and I think that is close upon us, but the combination of how man and machine work together. Yeah, I mean, I, I, really I, yeah, I, mean, I would like much prefer to categorize it as sort of uh, algorithms meet human rhythms and it's that sweet spot uh, in between that that's actually going to be the thing that defines those people that are going to win and those people that are going to be also rounds. Yeah, I mean you still need to set the rules for what that machine learning or that what the AI, uh, what, what the algorithms are going to go out and set to learn and someone needs to interpret that data needs to keep changing that but obviously machine learning can help accelerate all of those performance pieces but I mean talent is everything. We're a service business, and of course we need to invest in infrastructure and in tools and in systems. But ultimately, the people that walk through our lifts and in, in our doors and up our lifts every single day are what clients buy. But we all know it's about the personal relationship, that I trust you with my business. So I'm passionate about that. I think what is interesting, and again, uh, something I, I read about a lot, or I would try and practice uh, once you've read it, is we need to really understand that the generation of people coming into our business, or the majority of workers and colleagues in our business, are Gen Y. Um, and they have very different attitudes uh, to what kind of working environment, culture, their learning opportunity, the transparency they expect um, from their leadership. And we need to ensure that we are leading in a much more open, collaborative Way. There's mobility. What yeah. about diversity? Ah, yes. Um, so, as you may know, and some of my colleagues uh, will know, we, we have um, uh, we launched a program at Maxis, the media agency I used to run called Walk the Talk, which is about empowering our senior female leaders to understand any internal barriers they have, self limiting beliefs, take some time to think about their bigger game, their bold moves, how to um, create a strategy to to get there because when we look at the very top of our business, whilst we are pretty good overall and good at a senior-ish level, we still need more women to get to the very top of our organisation. And then once you broaden out from a gender diversity area, you need to then think about ethnicity, um, cultural sensitivity. We have a programme called All Means All at a Group M level, which is about LGBT. Um, and we also need to think about age and um, uh, economic diversity as well. 
um, to ensure that we are bringing people in from different backgrounds because we all know it makes better business sense to have more diversity of thought throughout the organisation and certainly at the very top of the organisation. So finally, Lindsay, you know, in your uh, uh, talks with, with clients, with our WPP companies, um, how do you see uh, the future? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? I'm, I'm always, I'm not even half glass full, I'm glass and a half Excellent. full. Excellent. If you're, if you're a Brit, that's a Cadbury's line, um, I think you have to be completely optimistic about uh, the opportunities afforded to us in the fourth industrial revolution. And when I, what energizes me is when I, I've been in New York for two weeks with some of my colleagues, we have so many fantastically talented, um, optimistic, clever, smart people with different backgrounds that all want to work together, collaborate, and, and just do great work for our clients that delivers growth. That's what gets people out of bed in the morning. And I, you know, I find it uh, hugely, I'm hugely optimistic about the future. Well, Lindsay Patterson, Chief Transformation Officer for WPP, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Well, I said don't go anywhere and he'll be back and you're back. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Let's take a, a few moments to talk about some of the data and analysis that we get on a regional basis across the world. Yes, indeed. There is a mixed picture, David, actually. If you split the world into three bits, I think it's best to illustrate that. First of all, China which is a real powerhouse in terms of growth. Uh, the brands have grown 47% in the last year alone, which is double the growth of those uh, in the US. So those two areas are growing very fast indeed. And uh, the rest of the world, Asia, excluding China, uh, and Europe, uh, including the UK, have got much steadier growth, much more modest growth. Well, let's take a look in particular uh, at uh, continental Europe, I suppose. That's our definition of Europe without the UK. <laughs> yes, the continental Europe, of course, have got some of the uh, most long-standing brands. Uh, so they're brands that we know and love for a many, many a long time. And the value of them, of course, uh, hasn't increased that much. It's still growing, but uh, compared to our benchmark of the top 100, uh, it's less than half of that. But if you're looking at the, at the top 10, uh, what we see is that the number one brand is a B2B brand, business to business brand, SAP, which again is benefiting from partnership with many other brands, either, either technology brands or other brands there, which is again a theme for success that we've seen coming out in this year's rankings. Um, you see telecoms making a, a big splash of the infrastructure brands in Europe, particularly with Deutsche Telekom and Movistar. Uh, Germany, of course, is the home of the luxury car. And what's really interesting this year is that Mercedes has gone just ahead of BMW for the first time, driven largely by terrific, uh, even greater success in China. And of course, then you get uh, France uh, and Italy, which are the home of fashion and luxury. So those brands also benefiting from the growth in the China area. And for the very first time this year, we've done a, a separate uh, ranking of the most valuable uh, French brands and the most valuable Italian and German brands. Yes, indeed. And uh, we'll see those coming out and we'll see how they get on compared to this year uh, in, the, in the following years. Well, here we are uh, in our studio in London, so we can't ignore the UK. Yes. <laughs> Even if the UK is trying to ignore uh, Europe, uh, what do we see when we look at uh, the top? Uh, UK brands? Well, the UK top 10 has the lowest of the comparable top 10 growth that we see, uh, a mere 69%. So let's put that into context. 69% is still many, many millions of dollars that brands are adding because of their attraction sure. to consumers. But it's fair to say that the UK brands have had much steadier growth. And if you look at the top 10, uh, you can see there, four of them are in the top 100. And again, they're very much to do with infrastructure type brands, telecom providers. You've got Vodafone at the top, HFC, Shell, and, and BT. So they are strong, powerful 
brands. But why have these brands not grown so much? Well, I think you have to look at uh, really the categories that they're in. So if you could just show us the categories, there we are. The categories that the US, uh, that the UK brands are in, all happen to be relatively low growth categories. So you can see that on the chart on the left going towards the right. Uh, all of those six categories there have got a UK brand in them and they're low growth. And most of those, of course, also have low innovation scores. Now, you, you, you've done a lot of work on looking at innovation and the importance of innovation. And in a funny way, innovation can't be underestimated now, can it? It certainly can't. So it's a perception of innovation. So do the consumers think this brand is the latest thing that I'm getting uh, for good value for the brand uh, that's making my life better? And so disrupting and leading the way in a creative sense of very much what uh, the innovation brands do. And of course, what we see is that innovation is a fantastic growth driver. Uh, you know, it's seven or eight times the brands over the period of 12 years that we've seen, those that are rated as being highly innovative have grown significantly more. So you cannot ignore uh, the area of innovation. And that's what some of these brands need to do, whether it's partnering with other brands, whether it's refreshing what they stand for, but certainly they have to be in touch with the modern consumer, both in their behavior and their experience. Now, if you want to know more about innovation and how innovative consumers view individual brands, the best place to go and look at that is Innovation Z uh, on the Brand Z platform. So, Peter, thanks very much indeed. Always very insightful uh, and a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Brand Z's tentacles runs deep, and this time it runs to Pittsburgh, where we caught up with Nathan Martin, the CEO of Deep Local. Well, I'm now here with uh, Nathan Martin, who is the Chief Executive of Deep Local. Uh, Nathan, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. One of the key observations that uh, come out of the Brand Z data is how important innovation is. In fact, one of the key ways of driving your van brand value is by being seen as highly innovative. Brands that are seen as highly innovative grow their brand value around the nine times the rate of those brands that aren't. In today's environment, Nathan, what is it that actually defines innovation and how should brands be innovative? I want to start by saying innovation is not necessarily technology. You think about what innovation is, it's about kind of the questioning of conventional wisdom and being able to do something different tomorrow than you did yesterday. It's that change and that rapid change. And why that I think is really interesting right now is for most brands, why that matters is because that constant change is what's appealing to younger audiences. Feel as though a brand is listening, is adaptive, is relevant, is aware, and, and honestly is, is authentically communicate with them. Now, you work for uh, some of the uh, largest brands that are in the Brand Z top 100 most valuable global brands. Um, in fact, our number one brand um, is uh, a brand that you work with. Tell us a little bit about what you do for Google. Sure. Uh, Google's one of our largest clients. We've worked with them for, uh, we're about 12 years old. I think we've worked for Google for about uh, eight years. Um, we're unique. I think at, at the simplest level, you can call us a creative technology partner for Google. But I think what we do is we understand technology. So let's say some of the core technology of Google that's, that's publicly known right now, things like Google Assistant that power Google Home and um, voice search and conversational UI. Um, that's a really important part of what Google is, is doing right now, and it powers a lot of the, uh, the products you might interface with. So we deeply understand not just what it is to a consumer, but also how it technically functions, what makes it different. Um, Google just announced a, a, a number of things at their Google I.O. developer conference. Yeah, and a lot of it, what you can see, is based in machine learning. Uh, machine learning is something that, uh, you know, you can get the one-liner pretty quickly, but diving deep into understanding how, what you can do with machine learning is pretty complicated. So I think we, uh, having a large engineering force here, we understand machine learning. 
we understand um, cloud technology, we understand the Google Assistant, and by understanding those things and combining that with storytelling, now how do we take these, these deeply complex things in a highly competitive space that uh, are difficult to communicate the value to a consumer and then combine that with story and then combine that with experience design. So essentially our whole company is really creative technology, story, and, uh, and design. People want to start to experiment in this area. What are the two things that they yeah. need to be doing now? So it, you can start to provide value through, uh, we're, we're, we're right now probably using machine learning in a lot of the things that we do on our phones, on our devices, and we may not just recognize it as machine learning. Um, so I think getting in uh, does not de need to be as complex. So the very first step is demystifying the new technology. I think that's important to do with every piece of new technology. Learn what you're actually talking about. And that includes everyone, not just engineers. So I think, you know, any creative strategists, researchers, we need to ask questions about the technology that exists, like machine learning, and that, that, that can be provided to us by experts. Now, Nathan, you're not in any way, shape or form a classic uh, agency. Um, tell us a little bit about, first of all, your structure, and then what that structure has enabled you to deliver for your clients. What we do is our, our company is made up of about half engineers and half people that come from maybe design strategy or, or what you maybe see at a typical agency. Um, the engineers come from really deep engineering backgrounds. So we have aerospace engineers, roboticists, mechanical designers, electrical engineers. So everything from designing our own circuit boards, building our own robots and machines, uh, all with our own kind of fabrication facility, which is a, a really um, like a prototyping lab basically. Everything from woodworking to machine shop to paint finishing and mold making, we do in-house. So in the typical world, you might consider us agency and production company in one. What that's enabled us to do um, is we've also evolved our creative team um, from people that don't typically come from agency backgrounds. So when we work on a brief similar to an agency with a client, a challenge, um, we respond with a team that combines story, which you know might come from strategy backgrounds, um, which is basically what's the point, what's the story we're trying to tell, the simple message, the connection to the brand. Um, combine that with experience design, which is on what's that gonna look like in the real world, in the physical way, how are people gonna engage with this? And then combine that with creative technology, which is how do we understand to use technology in an authentic, honest, and, and really exemplary way. A lot of our clients are technology clients. So we do this right now um, with, with clients that I think have a lot, of, uh, a lot of love from their customers. So Google, Spotify, Lyft, uh, Netflix, uh, Airbnb. Um, I'll give you some quick examples. The, the challenge was after, after 10 years or so of being around and initially being the disruptor with our red mailers, uh, now what we put into the world seems a lot, seems the same to our customers. They don't understand the difference. Um, and what we did was we started, and we're not a research firm either, but we started by doing really quick social listening. What are people talking about? And we came back with this insight, and for us, insights are not derived by ethnographers, they're, they're derived by our creative team. And, and our insight very quickly was that what you did, Netflix, by launching shows all at once into the world was you changed human behavior. You created this binge-watching culture. We saw people uh, putting their phones in Ziploc bags and watching in the shower or calling in sick to work or, getting upset uh, that their show, they would fall asleep and their show wouldn't pause. Those all became really ripe in, uh, insights that we could use to create uh, um, a campaign that we called the Make It Campaign. Okay, so another example uh, would be Zagat. Zagat is uh, a brand that's uh, owned by Google, ref, uh, rest, was owned by Google, a restaurant review guide. The brief to us was you know, similar. Uh, we, wanna be, um, uh, we wanna be relevant to millennials. So the challenge was that this had been around for a long time before things like Yelp existed. So how do you kind of create a restaurant review guide that, that millennials get excited about? And we actually did this with no technology at all, which is why I want to use it as an example. We found um, what we thought was really honest about the brand and what, what uh, Zagat did really well is they took restaurant reviews, consumer reviews, um, a bunch of quotes, and they kind of distilled those down into a single quote that people could get and understand very, very quickly. So it was like a tiny bite-sized quote. So imagine if you're trying to read TripAdvisor reviews and you have to read through them all to figure out which ones apply to you. This one distilled it down to a quote of quotes. And we thought that was like really the core brand value. And then we saw, um, similar to that, we saw this tiny food movement starting in Japan with videos that were racking up 
millions of views of people preparing tiny dishes. And we thought we could marry these together to serve, to talk about tiny reviews, bite-sized portions. So we partnered with a series of uh, 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 really well-known restaurants in New York, uh, Jacques Torres, Los Tacos, and Emily's Burgers, and we create for no money at all, and we created uh, bite-sized, tiny versions of popular dishes like mini tacos, tiny cookies from Jacques Torres. And we built a pop-up cafe in Astor Place that we served them out of for three days. And we developed a launch strategy. We had very much a plan in place of why it was three days and how it was choreographed. Um, but it was all designed for Instagram. Even though we didn't force anyone to share, we wanted to create something uh, that people would photograph naturally. And we wanted to use and leverage the social media followings of these restaurant partners and give them something in return as well. So we did all of that. Um, and that hit a billion earned media impressions with photos in New York Times and television media coverage and all with no technology. I look forward to uh, coming to see you soon. Uh, Nathan, uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care. Well, it was only a few months ago in Beijing where we launched the WPP Brand Z Top 100 Most Valuable Chinese Brands for 2018 in a packed room full of about a thousand brand builders and opinion formers. We discussed some of the key issues related to China and brand building. Here's a flavour of that event together with hearing from Anita Huang, who is the operating partner and CMO of Sinovation Ventures, one of China's leading artificial intelligence companies. And of course, artificial intelligence is going to become an extremely important part of all of our lives. What do you think, uh, which industries, I suppose, are going to be most impacted uh, by AI over the course of the next uh, few years and why? Sure. Yeah, um, I think I'll answer that by a framework uh, that's actually our investment thesis. We call it four waves of AI. And the four waves would happen not really one after the other. Uh, they are happening at the same time, but in terms of the um, the ease of converting or ease of embracing AI. The first way is very, very easy to understand and it's already happening. We call it internet AI. Uh, so pretty much everything that's happening via or on the internet can be um, AI enabled. Um, so like what I mentioned earlier, search engine, product recommendation, if you open your JD.com or your Taobao.com every day, you will see actually the products that's being shown to everyone is Tian Ren Tian Mian. So it's different, it's individualized, and it's targeted toward your search. Um, so I won't bore yourself into, into that. It's already happening. So if your brand, your uh, business operates on internet, uh, no matter it's solely or partially, there are definitely room uh, to provide a better experience through uh, AI technology. The second layer actually coupled with the first internet AI, we call it business AI, Shangyong uh, AI. So um, the, the first internet AI is largely facing the consumer. Uh, just think about business enterprise uh, that's operating on data. I will give some examples from our portfolio just for promotion, no, just for <laughs> better understanding. Uh, one company that we invested is called the Force Paradigm. Uh, it's now the strongest AI company that's revolutionary, uh, revolutionizing the traditional big banks. Um, so the force paradigm uh, is actually working on the back end of the banks, the financial institute. Uh, they build modules one by one. Uh, so for example, one module is for fraud detection. The other module is for uh, credit approval for loans. Uh, the other module can be better customer prospecting for finding new customers or, you know, better customer reactivation, uh, customer uh, uh, acquisition, et cetera. Um, so they are, their most recent funding is, I think it never happened before, but it's uh, invested by three national banks, 
of China. Uh, so they are on a good position to grow. And there are a number of uh, companies that I can mention. Uh, we went to see DD last, last week with an MIT professor. Um, actually, a number of the big um, uh, corporates are operating on consumer-facing service. I think customer service or customer care is usually a headache. And right now, 70% of DD's customer service is automated. And some of them are already empowered by AI, by the company that we invested. Well, it's always a pleasure and a delight to hear from our next guest, Eric Heller, who is the Chief Executive of Marketplace Ignition. Well, I'm now joined by Eric Heller, who is the founder and the chief executive of Marketplace Ignition. Eric, thank you very much indeed for joining us all the way from Atlanta. Thanks for the invitation. Um, Eric, as part of the process we go through to look at the valuations, to really understand what's happening to the brands and in particular categories, we get um, WPP experts from around all of our WPP companies in a room together looking at uh, sector by sector, all those experts. Um, I think it's true to say this year when we did this, there was one common theme that went through every single one of uh, those discussion groups, and that was Amazon. Irrespective of the sector, a sort of a, uh, a multitude of feelings, either fear of Amazon or anticipation of Amazon uh, entering into the sector and causing disruption. It seems like Amazon is the bogeyman uh, or woman uh, out at the moment. Do you think all brands and all sectors should be worried about Amazon or is it blown out of all proportion? You know, Amazon is certainly a disruptor in the majority of the world, the way Alibaba and, uh, and their related companies are in China and Asia Pacific. And I think the disruption though, I think in some ways is shaking up traditional uh, paths to market, paths to the consumer, but I'm not sure it's all about the fear, right? And Amazon gives you an opportunity to talk directly to consumers and in real time, read the feedback. And, uh, you know, I often say to brands, you know, how often do you get a chance to read everything everyone said of when, as they walked into the store about your product yesterday? So Amazon gives you this sense of real time feedback, feedback and this new opportunity. And we're seeing brand after brand that that says, look, we have a healthy fear of this platform, but we're also embracing it. And those brands, we're seeing over-index and take share from brands that are approaching this at a more uh, slow and careful pace. In some ways, like Amazon has characteristics of the press, right? If you play your cards right and you communicate well, people will, people will have a good and favorable social impression and social affirmation of the product that you want them to buy. The difference is that you can't really manipulate the press. And I don't want to say you can manipulate Amazon, but you can approach it better in such a way that you will get a better opportunity to improve and influence your reviews, ratings, and perception on the platform. And that can, in many ways, get a kind of affirmation you didn't have access to before. It's really hard to affect the press, but it's not so hard. Uh, I'm sorry, it is so complicated to affect Amazon, but it's complicated in a way that there is a methodology. now. Um, that doesn't, you know, I don't want to ignore the fact that Amazon is also a path to market where there's a lot of disruption. Now, you spend um, all of your time uh, helping brands and helping uh, WPP clients get the best out of Amazon. Um, what are your top three uh, recommendations of uh, what people should be doing to engage with Amazon to get the best out of them? So the number one recommendation I'd have is really focus on your supply chain. You know, this is a retailer that works like no other partner. Supply chain is an assortment plan. So assortment planning, supply chain, getting your products live and getting them shipped when you promise that they'll be shipped and, and shipping what Amazon asks you for is more important, believe it or not, to the success of your business on Amazon than getting the right promotion. Because if Amazon doesn't think that your product is reliably going to be in stock, they won't offer it at the top of search results and you will get outplayed by someone with a better operations game. The second part I would say is really understand 
and have the product or have the product people are looking for and really understand how people are searching for it. Uh, we had this great event in partnership with David's team in London where I gave this, um, I gave this, uh, this was back in October of last year, and I gave this great example of a client of ours that was selling insoles that they thought for the geriatric community. And they had described this thing as um, uh, incredible in all institutional environments, will not increase the slip and fall hazard, and um, great for all Velcro footwear. But the number, but when we went back in and mined the keywords and mined the customer feedback, the feedback for this product was uh, best, best insole ever for post-marathon foot pain. And it's such a great example. I don't mean to necessarily reuse the exact same example, but the reason why I was thinking about it this morning is someone asked me about that example uh, this week at that WPP event. And it's such a great example of understanding your customer in e-commerce can be different than your customer in physical commerce and be ready to embrace um, who that customer is and where they want to buy and how they want to buy it. And the most nimble brands are these digitally native brands who go into every e-commerce environment understanding exactly uh, what people are looking for and then go in and adapt the product for that or the description. Now, it seems hardly a day goes by without uh, a story from Amazon or um, from the market saying that Amazon about to go into category X or category Y. Um, you've got a pretty good insight uh, into uh, the world of Amazon. Um, if you're a betting man, what categories do you think they'll be in by the end of 2018? The layup here answer is health and personal care and well, health and wellness. And I use the word wellness um, specifically because we've seen their growth in supplements, we've seen them purchase whole foods, We've seen that integration get bigger. Here in, the, here in um, Atlanta, where I'm based, you know, I can get Whole Foods, anything from Whole Foods delivered with my Amazon purchase in two hours. And, you know, we've seen Instacart depart. We've seen Amazon Flex move in. I think that we're really going to see the growth of this. And we know that Amazon is not just solving for customers, but they're solving for employees with their combination um, with J.P. Morgan and some other players to try and create a health, and, uh, a, uh, health solutions for employees. And so I think that they're really going to do a lot of experiment there. Well, Aaron, you mentioned the uh, uh, seminar that we held uh, in London uh, the latter part of last year and uh, also uh, in New York. Um, the resources from that, uh, those sessions will be available to you as well for people watching this broadcast. And we'll give you the resources at URL uh, to uh, look at and download all the material at the end of this broadcast. But for the moment, um, Eric Heller. Uh, the founder uh, and the chief executive of Marketplace Ignition. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. In the latter part of last year, we held an event all about Amazon for our clients and colleagues in London and in New York. The base of that was to understand how you can both compete and also collaborate with Amazon and using the Brandsy data as the basis of understanding Amazon as a brand. Let's take a little flavor of that event. Amazon Web Services, that's their cloud business. Why are they in the cloud? Well, they're a technology company. They have a lot of data. Uh, they need to store a lot of data. Uh, so let's put it all up in the cloud. They are the leader in that business. And I tell any CEO that I meet that I, whose stock I cover, if you ever want to double the multiple in your stock, just talk about the cloud because the market loves the cloud. A lot of geographic expansion um, globally. So we're starting to see the company become much more aggressive globally uh, because the US market for them is a little bit more penetrated. Um, so it's just amazing and just in terms of, you know, just total users, Amazon.com, when you think about the website, you don't necessarily think about it in the context of users, 
but you know, it's almost as big as Google and Facebook. Amazon actually ranked third, um, which given the size of Amazon last year is a massively impressive achievement. So they've added more than 40% of their brand value over the course of the last 12 months alone. So this is a brand that is not only big and growing, its momentum is growing over time. So an incredibly impressive achievement again. So think about this. Amazon cares most about the customer experience. They start with the customer and work, work backwards. In fact, they do things that many of us think are irrational, things that are margin negative, because it, it helps the customer experience, and they're basically down, making a down payment for the future. This is genius because it allows you to scale very effectively. So it allows Amazon, allows you to really reach a very large number of people outside of the Amazon environment, but leveraging that Amazon data very effectively. When Amazon ran a two-year pilot selling Alexa in the States, at the end of that two years, looked to sell it everywhere else. And you can only take from that 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 two-year pilot was deemed to be successful. But what that means is that the behavior has become normalized. The most important thing is, is just do something. Right? I talk to a lot of brands, a lot of companies which talk a big game. But when it comes down to it, they don't put their money where their mouth is. And you cannot be a fast follower anymore. It's the point where technology is moving so quickly, you have to just do something. Be happy to fail, um, and just at least you've learned something, you can move on and do something else. And also they're ruthless. And they're ruthless because they focus on one simple thing, and that's everyone in this room and their customers and the shopper. How we shop, where we shop, what we buy and why we buy it. And because of that customer centricity, they are relentlessly winning a greater share of our wallet. They have a culture that celebrates waste. Every retailer I work with, have a lot, has a culture of obfuscating waste, wishing it away, averaging it, pretending it wasn't there. Amazon celebrates it because they recognize that understanding waste is the only way to prioritize and make things better. You were never really that competitive, so we actually decided to cede some of that to Best Buy. Went up market with our mobile phone cases, so price points you know, north of $15 instead of like the $3 stuff you get on Amazon. And just accept that you're not going to win every single battle and choose the ones that you are going to win. Well, I'm now here with Karen Blackett OBE, who is the WPP country manager for the UK and is also a UK government trade ambassador. Karen, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Pleasure. A nice, uh, sunny uh, London day sunny for a day. change. Uh, Karen, you've recently been appointed as the country manager for WPP here in the UK, uh, one of uh, WP's most important uh, markets. Uh, what's the role of the country manager? And I suppose more, most importantly, um, how will this benefit our clients? Look, I think uh, the role very simply is to try and help our clients' businesses grow, um, to try and help connect them across the different parts of WPP. We have got brilliant, amazing superheroes within our organisation, and I talk about how we should be an Avengers Assemble of Talent. So lots of different organizations with superhero powers and it's knowing when to connect them in order to help our clients business grow and to order to help their business sprint um, so my role really is to work with our opcos to make sure that they know each other and know the skill sets of the opcos and most importantly talk to our clients to know that when there's a particular business issue what is the unique combination of different opcos that we can bring together to help solve that particular business problem or to help make sure that they are navigated and connected to the right people. And, and that navigation and that curation, I think, is going to become uh, more and more important as clients look for specific sorts of skill sets to add to their internal teams. Look, I think we've got amazing skill sets, and I think part of the difficulty that clients have is knowing when to tap into those different skill sets or knowing what some of the opcos do. So. You know, Lindsay Patterson says really eloquently that our role is to solve, not sell. Um, and that's exactly it, to make sure that as those different areas of a client business becomes more specialised or it requires a new skill set that they might not have internally, to try and help connect. Now, you also spend uh, a fair proportion of probably your free time, if you have any free time, um, with working with the, uh, the UK government. Yes. Um, and I, I can't let you get away without asking a couple of questions uh, in relation to where 
UK British brands are going to be in a sort of a Brexit, post sort of Brexit world. Is that something that is full of opportunity or full of fear, do you think? Look, I think uh, whatever way anybody voted, um, I think we have to now look at Brexit as an opportunity for brands. And I think we have an opportunity to attract brands to the UK to help kickstart or further grow their business in terms of international brands. So one of the roles which I um, fulfill for the government is a business ambassador look, looking after the creative industry sector. And that's to encourage foreign direct investment to the UK. And I think Britain and brand Britain is very well placed. In and, terms and, what, and what does Britain bring to the party? Why should people inwardly invest into Britain? Look, the I think world? there's amazing culture. I mean, recently we had um, the Best Country survey which came out where the UK ranked as number four. I think there is a fantastic sense of entrepreneurship within the UK. There genuinely is. There's fantastic diversity in the UK, which I think can help when brands are thinking about different consumers that buy their products. And culturally, I think there's amazing culture in the UK as well. And infrastructure is brilliant as well. And we are the gateway to a load of other markets as well. So I think there's many areas that brands and companies should think about investing in the UK. And what about, what about the other ways? It's also a great opportunity you know, in, in an in a environment that isn't, depending on your perspective, constrained by a, a focus on Europe to get out there and go to other countries Look, around which, the world. Whichever way we go, wherever we go with single market, whatever the, you know, the, who the, knows? <laughs> the different uh, arguments are and debates are having at the moment, I do think um, we have got a really strong track record of brands in the UK doing well externally and how we export, especially in the creative industry sector. We have a very strong track record, whether that is programmes like Doctor Who through to companies like Innocent. We've got a strong track record of export. And I do think we should now venture into new areas that we might not have thought about before. So whatever way you look at it, you know, the next middle-class billion consumers wasn't coming from Western Europe. It were coming from markets such as Africa or markets such as the Middle East, which we should now look at exploring more as brands. Now, finally, you come from a media background. We're here at the Mediacom offices, which yes. uh, you ran for many years yes. here, in, here in the UK. Um, from a media perspective, the next few years, is this going to be exciting or terrifying? Exciting, because anything's media now, and that's the bit that I think is incredibly exciting and the bit that I do think that brands and clients need our help to navigate because anything can be media, anything can help form an opinion in a consumer's mind where you can be on a prioritisation list and off again just as quickly. So it's incredibly exciting, technological advances in terms of being able to look at mass personalisation is fantastic but also looking at how we build brands, incredibly exciting in the UK. Well. An exciting few years ahead in terms of Brexit and cleaning the media world. Karen Blackett, uh, Country Manager of WPP, thank you very much indeed for joining My us. My absolute pleasure. Well, I'm now with Jim Pryor, who's the Chairman of Super Union. Jim, uh, a pleasure to be here actually in your, in your new offices. Brand new office. Yeah. Um, it's very, and very nice of this too. Thank you. Um, Super Union is uh, a new WPP entity. Um, it's the, co the combination of a number of companies that I think everybody uh, watching today's uh, broadcast is very familiar with. Brand Union as an, ex as an example, Lambie Nair another. Mm. What was the genesis of Super Union? Why put all these uh, uh, well-known brands together into mm. one entity? Mm. Well, well-known brands individually strong with, with, with specialisms in each, but, but ultimately much more opportunity in combination than apart, so really geared around what we were hearing from our clients about the need to be served more completely with, with more sets of services, led by really strong people that understand their business and, and help them plot a path forward. I suppose that's the status quo. What's the future? What's the vision? How, how do you see all these combination of fantastic skills, great people, great insight uh, helping clients going forward. Right? Yeah, so, so I mean, we think there's great opportunity to really develop and offer a brand-led 
and creatively led offer that solves you know, big business challenges that, that advises clients with a neutral perspective on what the no nature of the, of the solution might be, but then has the ability to dive down into all sorts of different areas in order to deliver. So, you know, really building partnerships with clients where we can serve them more completely, serve them more fully, link up, of course, across the WPP network with other uh, 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 other uh, skills and other capabilities that we have in abundance to influence and, and, and drive the success of those client businesses more. Yeah. So how, how, how would you frame now the brand experience versus the identity of the brand? Yeah. Well, it, well the, the brand experience is, is, is everything that you encounter whenever you encounter it, which might be in small, um, small moments and small points in time, or it might be a you know, a, a, a really big thing happening a lot of the time. But, but if you do not manage your brand with a complete and holistic view uh, across everything that you do and the way that that connects and, and integrates with itself, reinforces every other uh, experience that you provide to people, then you are missing a trick. Then you will be found out by but, but given, consumers and given by given how many touch points there are now, I mean, you know, customer journeys used to be unbelievably linear. And you, mm. yeah, those are starting mm. an end to them. Now mm. they're all over the place. They're very mm. eclectic mm. and there isn't a, a start mm. and beginning. So how do you manage all of that in terms of being able to get your hands on uh, where mm. the customer touches the brand? What's mm. the most important mm. aspect of that and where do you focus yeah. your time yeah. Yeah. Well, I think and resource? Just, because of course clients and, and organizations don't necessarily even control all of the brand experiences well, that yeah. people have in them now, right? So, so the, the, the most important thing it's is to have It's the notion of a brand manager these days. Well, the notion, yes, uh, which, strange, which becomes more yeah. and more conceptual yes. in some ways. But, but I think what it does is it reinforces the importance of having an idea uh, you know, a strategy, uh, something at the heart of your brand that is clear, that is defined, that is unifying, and that goes across everything. So, you know, brands almost move to me from, to, there's a very high level philosophy almost, a position that sits at the heart of everything, and then there's a lot of granular detail and activity that sits between. It's the, it's the bits in the middle that really get challenged. You've got to have a unifying idea in your brand, and you've got to be prepared to deliver against that and, and, and manage against that in a consistent way across the whole landscape of your brand. Now, one of the, th the themes we see in uh, this year's uh, Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018 um, is an increase in value of, uh, I suppose, brands that are outside of uh, the, the uh, developed markets. So mm. I think what we would classify these days as fast-growing markets. Mm. Um, those types of markets, we've been talking about maybe uh, Indonesia, mm. this year we've got our first brand from Indonesia in the top 100, um, India, Malaysia, um, a lot of those, uh, and China of course, a lot of those countries were very slow in actually getting to understand how important that uh, overall concept of what the brand is and how it uh, manifests itself at every mm. single touch point. Mm. But I sense that's changing. Mm. I think it has changed. I mean, you, you, I'd almost argue that they were never slow at getting it. They just, they just didn't start getting it until recently, and then they've got it really fast. You know, the, a characteristic of all those markets is that they learn fast really fast, you know, whether that's in the adoption of technology or whether that's in the adoption of general business process and practice or whether it is in this case in, in the nation, notion of brand and all those markets you mentioned, that a real, real fast pace of change there, a real enthusiasm. Uh, for the brand. You know, it's, it's interesting in a country like Indonesia, a lot of businesses are family owned or at least controlled by, you know, small numbers of people. That gives them permission actually to move really fast. Well, every uh, chairman has a crystal ball to see into the future. Um, looking in your crystal ball in the, in the branding and uh, area, what, what do you see are the major developments that's going to be important for all of us going forward in the next few years? I mean, I think, I think there are a couple of things. One, one is differentiation is absolutely key to organizations now. It, it is no longer enough to be able to compete on the basis of good quality product and good pricing and, and, and you know, generic. You know, one might argue that it's been ever so, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I think we're really entering a time now where differentiation is absolutely key. I think that's going to become more and more and more so. The, the question is, what is the real value that you give me as an organization that I could not get from somewhere else? Well, Jim Pryor, you've got an army of brand engineers now around the world to be able to implement that. Uh, I think uh, your crystal ball looks very exciting. Thanks very much, Steve, for thank joining you. us. Thank you very much, David.
Well, we're nearly at the very end of today's special Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018 Web Seminars. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Don't go away because after this we'll be telling you how you can download and get all the information that we've talked about during the course of today's web seminar. But we can't leave this web seminar without saying a massive thank you to somebody who's seminar, this is going to be their last one, and that's Peter Walsh. Peter has been with Brand Z ever since it started, in fact, before it started, when it was just a concept and an idea. And I said earlier that he is the wise sage of Brand Z. He really is the foundations and the rock of Brand Z. So Peter, on behalf of all of us, we would like to say thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for extending the period uh, that you're, you were going to work at uh, Emil Brandon with us um, for a few more years so we can get the knowledge and the wisdom extracted all from you. It's been personally an absolute pleasure and delight to work with you for all of these years. You've always been unbelievably generous uh, with your insight and your knowledge and uh, a, a, a real rock and somebody who I can always go to for great, good, impartial advice and a continuous amount of innovation. All of us wish you an absolute joy and health and success in your forthcoming retirement. Peter Walsh, on behalf of everybody at Brandsy right across the world, thank you very much. Thank you. I just wish you'd said something nice about it. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Peter, thanks. Well, that's it. This is the end of today's WPP web seminar for the Brandsy Top 100 Most Valuable Global Brands for 2018. All it leaves us to do is to find a great opportunity to give this to a well-deserved award winner for Google being the number one brand in the 2018 study. This new award, which also has on the back of it an essay by Jeremy Bullmore on what makes a brand a brand. Well, as I said earlier, all the information that we've shared with you today will be available for you to download from the WPP Brand Z website, which the address is somewhere over here. You'll also be receiving today an email that will have the URLs where you can download some of this material and also some additional material. I'd just like to say a very big thanks to everybody who's helped put this production together. Studio Stream, uh, Igor Torkachev from uh, our team here in London and everybody from the team from Cantar Millwood Brown and Brand Z. But for me, David Roth here in London, thank you very much indeed for watching and have a great rest of the day. <laughs>